Good morning. It is so good to see everybody today. Hope everyone is having a great weekend. Isn't it wonderful to be able to be here with those that we love, our brothers and sisters in Christ and our friends to worship God and to learn from His Word. We appreciate every opportunity that we have to be together for the encouragement that we glean from each other. We look forward to these times each and every week. To all of our members, it's good to see you. We do have several that have not been able to be with us for a while that are back with us today. We're glad that you're doing better. We have several visitors with us as well, and we're excited that you've come our way. We invite you to come back and worship with us here any time that you have the opportunity to do so. Glad to have my Uncle Jim with me today, with us here. And Uncle Jim, uh, Jim Menard, has recently moved here into town and is going to be worshiping with us here at Pyburn Street. And I'm glad that uh, he's able to be with us. I've always appreciated Uncle Jim and his encouragement and glad, that, glad to have him with us. Also want to mention uh, tonight at 6 o'clock will be our end of the month singing night and devotional. And we encourage all of you that can to be back this evening for that evening. We always have a a very encouraging time together whenever we come together and worship God in song. I think that we would all agree that the world around us is not functioning the way that it should. In fact, we could say that our world is upside down. But whenever we think about this from a Christian perspective, this idea of turning the world upside down really means setting the world back right side up. In Acts chapter 17, verses 5 through 7 that Brother Jadon shared with us just a few moments ago, we find that Paul and Silas and Timothy have recently left Philippi. They have come into the city of Thessalonica, and as was their custom... They went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Paul stood up and he began to reason with the Jews from the scriptures. And as a result, we're told that there were many Jews, many prominent citizens of the city began to be converted to Christ. But there were many as well who rejected that message. Many didn't like the things that were taking place. They wanted everything to remain the same. Everything was at peace. The Jews had an agreement with Rome, and as long as they kept themselves in check, then they were allowed to exercise their faith and have their own society the way that they wanted to, so long as they were willing to give tribute to Caesar. But as more and more individuals began to be converted to Christ, the Jews decided, we've got to do something about this. We have got to try to silence these men in some way. And so, as we saw in these verses, it says, But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason." And sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Well, like today... The Roman world, as well, needed to be turned upside down. The immorality, the idolatry that reigned supreme in the Roman Empire of the first century, as well as the hypocrisy of the Jews, the corruption of their political leaders, and basically life in general among those who were pagans and among those who were Jews, made things very difficult for Christians to live under that system. But as Christians then, as well as now, a charge has been given to us. We are to be lights to the world. We are to be influencing the world around us through our Christian influence. And we do that through the good, moral, and godly traits that we allow to be exemplified in our life. 
But whenever we think about what was taking place, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, folks, they came to town and they upset the apple cart. They came to town and they started stirring people up. No, they weren't coming into town intentionally uh, trying to get people stirred up. But because of the fact that they were coming in, preaching things that required people to go against the status quo, to go against the things that they had believed and had practiced and been accepted for years at this time, some people just were not willing to accept that. Well, as their Christian influence began to spread, notice the Jews came up with this idea. They said, well, we know they're staying with Jason. We're going to go to the house of Jason. We're going to drag them out and take them before the officials of the city. Well, they get to the household of Jason, and lo and behold, these three men, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they're not there. Well, they've already got this mob stirred up. They've got to do something. Some kind of action has to come about. So they seize Jason, they seize his household, they seize certain other Christians in the city, and they drag them before the Roman officials. And as they come before these officials, they seek to hold Jason and these other Christians accountable for the things that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were doing. Essentially, they are putting them in the position of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Because when they stand before these rulers, they're not talking about Jason and these other Christians. Everything they bring up is things that Paul and his companions are doing. They're brought before these Roman officials and the Jews. They said, you know these people that we've been hearing about that's turning the world upside down and all these other places? Guess what? They're here now. They've now come to our city. Well, I want you to think with me for just a moment. To the Jews, they intended this to be an insult. These men that are turning the world upside down, they're stirring things up, they're causing trouble. They intended this to be an insult. But the brethren, I believe, saw it as a compliment. They were probably thinking to themselves, yes, we are trying to change the world. Yes, we are trying to turn things around and and bring it back into a proper focus. And yes, there is a king that is greater than Caesar. But the question that I want us to think about this morning is this. How did the church in the first century get to the point where they had such a significant impact on the world that they were truly bringing about change? The Jews would not have charged them with this if it wasn't true. If they weren't bringing about change in those cities, the Jews wouldn't have gotten stirred up. But everywhere they went, they were making a difference. Lives were being changed. People were being converted. They were truly turning the world upside down. But more importantly, we need to ask it this way. How can we as Christians in the year 2024, turn our world upside down. Now, in our society today, we may be tempted to believe that we can rely on things like political action. And certainly it's important, as as we often hear in uh, prayers that are offered, that we elect people into office that are going to stand for uh, moral principles. Yes, that's important. Or some may believe that we should rely on physical force, you know, force that kind of change. Or resort to some other worldly means in order to bring about that kind of change. But how did the early church do it? How did these Christians in the first century change their world? Well, the early church, as well as the words of Jesus, give us a blueprint. Give us a pattern that we can follow. That if we will do the things that they did, we too can turn the world upside down. 
Well, just before Jesus ascended back into heaven, He was seeking to comfort the twelve men who would become the apostles. He knew the difficulties that the future days held for them. He knew that their lives would not be easy. He knew the task set before them was not going to be one that would be simple. And so Jesus made them a promise. And I want you to notice these words in John 16, verses 2 and 3. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Then if you skip down to verse 13, it says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. So if we want to turn the world upside down in the way that the early church did, the first thing that we have to do is we have to diligently study the Word of God. As the apostles went throughout the world proclaiming the gospel, they were led by the Holy Spirit. They had a benefit that we do not have today. They had the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Whenever they stood up to speak, they did not have to think deeply about what they wanted to say. They did not have to study long and hard of their lessons before because they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But this promise that was made to the apostles was not one that was intended to be continuous. We do not have the gift of inspiration today. So subsequent generations of Christians, those who were not apostles, those that the apostles did not lay their hands upon and convey that gift to, they had to devote themselves. And Acts chapter 2, and the very first day of the existence of the church, were told what they had to devote themselves to. Acts 2 and verse 42 tells us they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine to the things that were being proclaimed by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through these apostles of God. This is also why Paul told Timothy, who, by the way, was not an apostle, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So unlike the apostles, Timothy had to put forth effort into learning. We see that from the youngest of age, he was being taught in the Scriptures by his mother and his grandmother. He then began to travel with Paul, learning at his feet. But the Scriptures never tell us that Timothy was gifted with the gift of inspiration. They never tell us that he became an apostle. So he had to put forth an effort. And then even here, as Paul is getting close to the end of his life, Timothy more than likely is middle-aged at this time, he's still being told, You have to study the Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 12 through 17, we find Paul reminding Timothy that the God-breathed Word of God was the solution to the increasing moral corruption and unfaithfulness in the world of that day. Well, the early church turned the world upside down, and the way they did that was by preaching the gospel of Christ. There's no doubt about that. There's no question. Read through the book of Acts. We find the way that people were being converted was through the preaching of the word. But before they could proclaim the word, they first had to know the word. And the only way they could come to know the word was by studying the word, being diligent, in learning the things that are contained therein. And likewise, the only way that we can come to know the Word of God and proclaim it to the world, we have to diligently study the Word of God. If we want to change the world, we have to know the Word. Because the Word of God is the only thing that is sufficient and powerful enough to bring about that change. We're not going to do it in any other way. We have to know the Word and we have to share the Word. But in addition to studying diligently, we also have to love radically. 
Now think about that for just a moment. We have to study the Word, but we also have to love radically. What that means is that our love has to be unlike the love that we see in the world. The love that Christians exhibit is radical because it's not found anywhere else. We don't see it in any other relations of life that we have. Folks, the world cannot be changed. It cannot be turned upside down if we love like the world loves. The love of Christ... It's an attention getter, isn't it? It softens hearts. It shows the intention that God has for us. And by loving people the way that Christ loved us, having that godly form of love for one another, we will set this course or set this world on the right course. I want you to remember the words that Jesus shared with his disciples in Luke 6, verses 27 through 36. And and this is such a long passage, I'm going to paraphrase this for us. He says that they are to love their enemies, do good to those who hate them, bless and pray for those who curse them and abuse them, turn the other cheek to one who slaps them in the face, give their tunic to the one that takes their cloak, give to every person who begs them, not demand their stolen goods back, treat others the way they want to be treated, lend money to those that they know can't pay them back, be kind and merciful to those who are grateful and evil. Simply put, that is a radical form of love. It is so unlike the world. In this world, love is measured by the amount of love we receive in return. If you love me, I'll love you. If you're good to me, I'll be good to you. But as Christians, we have all heard the lessons taught about different types of love. The love of the world is what I call I love you because. I love you because you're going to do something for me. We could also call that the I love you if form of love. Folks, that's not love. That's manipulation. Yeah, I, I'll love you, but you're going to do something for me in return. Folks, that's not love. The second type of love that we found is the type of love that we have only for God. We love God because He first loved us. But then there's a third form of love, and I like to call it the I love you anyway type of love. That's the kind of love that Christians are to have For each and every person. I love you no matter what. No matter what. That is the kind of love that will change the world. In the book of Acts, the first Christian converts that we read about, they are described as being very loving and caring individuals. In Acts 2, 44 and 45, it says, And all who believed were together and had all things common, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Simply put, these early Christians loved each other so much that they made sure that all of their brethren's needs were being met. They made sure that they had the necessities of life. They were willing to make sacrifices on their own part in order to provide for others. And as a result, people saw the difference. People recognize that, you know, there's something special about these Christians. They're not like everybody else. But in the world that we live in, I think we could describe it as a world of hate. And it's growing more and more like that every day. But you think with me for just a moment. In a world of hate, if you have a group of people who love each other genuinely, love each other sacrificially, they're going to have an impact on that world. They're going to change that world. But we also need to recognize that 
all of the study in the world, all the love in the world, it accomplishes nothing if we do not boldly proclaim that word. This is specifically how the early church turned the world upside down. They boldly proclaimed the word first because they had studied the word and because they loved the souls of mankind enough to do it. They didn't keep it to themselves. They did not act one way when they were together in the assembly and act another way hiding their religion when they went out into the community. They didn't turn red with embarrassment or run away in fear any time that they had to speak about Christ. The world is only going to be turned upside down if there's more Christians in it. And the only way that we can get more Christians in the world is we have to boldly proclaim the gospel. We have to carry the word out into the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have to fulfill that great commission. Jesus, he told his disciples in Luke 12 verses 4 and 5 that they had a very good reason to be bold in their proclamation. He said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who will kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. He said, you don't need to worry about what man says and does. You don't need to worry about if man is going to get angry or get offended by what you have to say. Man has no bearing upon your soul's salvation. You need to be more concerned with doing the things that God expects you to do. I want you to look at just a few passages that show just how bold the Christians in the early days of the church were. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now hold on a minute. So the Jews, when they recognized how bold Peter and John were in their proclamation of the truth, it led them to realize these are godly men. These are people that truly know God's will, that are doing the truth. And they knew that because of the boldness, the courage that they had. Then if we look at verses 18 and 20 also of Acts chapter 4, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They were standing before individuals at this point who could take their life, who had the authority to put them to death. And they said, do with us what you must. But we have to tell about the things that we've seen and heard. We have to. There's a boldness there. You know, we can look at many more passages, but our time is getting short. Throughout the book of Acts, we see bold proclamation of the gospel. Even the way that the book of Acts ends, it ends with the Apostle Paul in Rome under house arrest, waiting to stand trial before Caesar, not knowing how his life is going to, to, to happen, what's going to happen in his life after that. But yet, we see that he spent two years, and during that time, he welcomed every person that desired to come to him. Every person that wanted to hear the gospel, he welcomed them in. Even in this, this difficult situation of life, he continued to boldly proclaim the Word of God. Now something that I have been curious about at various times, you know, that's the way that Acts ends. Paul is in prison. We don't know what's going to come next. And it leaves you wondering, okay, well, what's Acts chapter 29? What happened next? Well, I recently read a statement from a commentator that I think is, is very, very wise. 
He said, Acts chapter 28 leaves one wondering, where is Acts 29? But the answer is that we are Acts 29. We are supposed to pick up where our brethren of previous generations have left off being bold and unafraid to speak about Jesus no matter the consequences. I like that. And that is true. You know, in David's prayer this morning, he he offered thanks for those that had led us to the truth, those who had taught us. Each one of us can think of those in our mind's eye that had an influence upon us spiritually that are no longer with us, that have gone on into eternity. But who are the ones who are now doing the work that they did? Who are the ones that are being the encouragers? Who are the ones that are developing these future generations? The early Christians, they suffered death, persecution. They lost property. All of this for the cause of Christ. But folks, you think about this with me. If we today are not willing to sacrifice our comfort, if we're not willing to endure social awkwardness, if we're not willing to face you know, cultural exclusion, then our grandchildren are going to have a much tougher time in sharing the gospel than we have today. This world is not going to change on its own. It's going to continue to get worse and worse. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. The only way that we can change this world is we have to be bold in our proclamation of the truth. Also, two last points. I'll touch on these just briefly. We have to pray fervently. One of the things that I think our brethren neglect from time to time is to recognize the true power of prayer. We need to be a praying people. Paul tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. But stop and ask yourself this question. When is the last time that you prayed on behalf of the church? When's the last time that you prayed on behalf of the work of the church? When's the last time that you offered prayer on behalf of our elders? When is the last time that you offered prayer on behalf of our teachers? When is the last time you offered prayer for our missionaries and others that are going through the world carrying the gospel? Every Christian should be involved in praying that the work of the church will continue that opportunities to boldly proclaim the Word will be afforded to us. And as we read in Colossians 4, 2 through 6, we need to be praying for doors of opportunity to open in front of us. When's the last time that you prayed that God would put you in the path of someone that you could share the gospel with? We need to be praying for our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members, our brothers and sisters that have grown weak, that have gone astray. We need to be praying that God will give us the boldness to carry the gospel to those who are in the world. And then lastly, number five, we need to trust God completely. If we're going to turn the world upside, we have to believe with all of our heart that God can do it. The early church was committed. They believed it. They acted upon it. The world changed. When the apostles were ordered to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, they stood before those Roman officials and they said, you know what? We have to obey God rather than man. We're going to do what God tells us to do. And they trusted in God to take care of them no matter the circumstances. No matter what they had to face, they knew that everything was going to be okay. Because they believed in God and trusted in Him. And you think about Stephen when he is there and and those rocks are being rained down upon him and the confidence that he has of knowing that heaven's about to be his home. 
that he's about to go to be with the Lord, he'll be in that paradise resting until the day of judgment. He faced that with confidence because he trusted God completely. Folks, our world needs to be turned upside down. It needs to be set straight. And the only way that we can do that is by following the blueprint that's been set forth for us through the Word of God and through the example of the early church. We do that through study, through loving one another, through speaking boldly, by praying fervently, and by trusting God completely. But we can't be like the world and change the world. The only way that we're going to be able to change the world is we have to be different. We have to set ourselves apart from the world. We have to take upon us those traits, those godly traits, and allow that light to be shown to the world around us. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, we all recognize that there's work to be done. We know that there are souls to be saved. We know that there is a world that needs to be set right. I encourage you today, get to work. Do the things that you can do. Share the gospel with those that you come into contact with. Help to further the cause of Christ in every way that you can. But as we bring our lesson to a close today, it may be that there is someone that you examine yourself and you realize that you've not been living the Christian life as you should. Maybe you've allowed sin to come back into your life. Or maybe you've fallen into a period of discouragement and need the prayers and the encouragement of your brothers and sisters. We want you to make that known. Or if there is someone who has never obeyed the gospel of Christ and today you believe that Jesus is God's Son, we encourage you to act upon that faith. Repent of those worldly, sinful ways and set your sights on things above. Come forward, confess the faith that you have in Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord will add you to the church and you can begin today living a life that is faithful to God. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come while we stand and sing.